Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, a podcast on the internet about movies. As far as we know, this is the only so-called podcast on the so-called internet about so-called movies. So what makes this unique show even more uniquer, you may well ask? Why, it's because we don't just talk about whatever movies happen to drift across the transom of our minds. No way! We pick a theme and then select six movies based on that theme. The title makes a lot more sense now, don't it? After we select these movies, my friend Chad Cooper and I, that's Bo Ransdell, then get to work crafting an artisanal podcast experience for you by doing copious notes on movies that no one should watch in the first place and even taking the time to piece together some information that you should find interesting or at least will cover up the screaming inside your head. This month, our theme is Bombs Away, a set of six movies that were infamous bombs at the box office, ruined careers, and drove audiences away from the cineplexes in horror. We have come to our second example of explosive entertainment with an adaptation of a children's book by Berkeley Breathitt, yes, the Bloom County guy, which resulted in a movie that is nigh unwatchable, Mars Needs Moms. So kick back with your favorite beverage and turn down the lights. It's another animated episode of Pick 6 Movies. Take it away, Chad. When I was an undergraduate in college, I worked full-time. Like a lot of college students, I waited tables and bartended. I also sold plasma here and there. During one particular shift, I was bartending on a slow weekday, serving up drinks to daytime alcoholics. I was reading the school newspaper, and I commented on how terrible the comic strips were. Specifically, how they were not funny at all, and they were poorly drawn. A coworker of mine said, hey, if you think you could do better, you should submit a new comic strip. All three student cartoonists are graduating and they need new people to fill their vacancies. The job pays 10 bucks a strip. Wait, 10 bucks a strip? That's 50 bucks a week. That's 200 bucks a month. And that was my monthly car payment on a late model Ford Bronco 2 with a cracked radiator that drank more water than I did. And all I had to do was scribble out equally terrible cartoons, like the ones that I was seeing on a daily basis in our school newspaper, along with something that kind of resembled a joke. That was how I could earn 200 extra bucks a month. It was a no brainer. I'd never drawn a comic strip in my life and I didn't know how the process worked. So I just went to an art store and I bought what looked like drawing supplies. I created a stencil with four panels and I whipped up two weeks worth of comic strips in total. I dropped him off at the school newspaper office. Bingo, bango, I got the job. And for two years, I was a paid cartoonist who delivered daily hilarity in a comic strip called Paradise that featured a wide range of characters that were inspired or more to the point, ripped off from the work of one man, Berkeley Breathed, and his brilliant and funny comic strip, Bloom County. Once upon a time, the comics page in newspapers was this mashup of art and humor and social commentary. Kids love the comics page. Adults love the comics page. It was a jumping off point for many of today's pop culture icons, Charlie Brown and the rest of the Peanuts gang, Garfield, Dilbert, Dick Tracy, Calvin and Hobbes. Millions of people every day opened up a newspaper and enjoyed laughing with and at the genuinely family friendly humor of the newspaper's funny pages. In the 1980s and 90s, comic strips were homes for incredibly popular and wildly talented satirists who were extremely gifted cartoonists. Aaron McGruder's The Boondocks, Gary Larson's The Far Side, Bill Amen's Foxtrot, Lynn Johnson's For Better or For Worse, and Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury were all cartoonists who reflected and highlighted changes in pop culture, political hypocrisies, the shifts in social issues, often with a dose of silliness thrown in. And they did this every day of the week and in color on Sundays. And Berkeley Breathitt's Bloom County led the way in mixing and matching all of the elements a comic strip could offer for readers from goofy jokes and bad puns, pointed social commentary, pathos, melancholy, and heartfelt joy in three to four panels each day of the week. Brethren was born in Encino, California. He later attended high school in Houston, Texas, and he went on to attend college at the University of Texas in Austin. He studied photojournalism and worked as a photographer for that school's newspaper, The Daily Texan. Brethren admitted in an interview with The Onion much later in his career that during his time as a school newspaper photographer, he once burned a halo onto a street preacher in a photograph. He also wrote a story about a student releasing hundreds of baby alligators into a nearby lake of the university 
University, and he included a photo of that student releasing one of the baby alligators. This led to Breathed getting ratted out by around 200 people. He was visited by federal game agents. His story reportedly caused local property values to drop, and he was ultimately arrested for this particular stunt. With a flair for creative nonsense, it was suggested that he may be better suited as a cartoonist rather than a photographer. So he took this gig and he created a comic strip called Academia Waltz, which featured an arrogant and obnoxious fraternity member named Steve Dallas, who would go on to become an icon among some groups at the University of Texas. The strip also introduced a character named Saigon John, a Vietnam War veteran who participated in protest marches and conflicted with the more conservative views of Steve Dallas. These two characters would later find themselves as principal players in Breathed's next more professionally published comic strip, Bloom County. In December of 1980, Bloom County debuted as a nationally syndicated comic strip by the Washington Post Writers Group in two dozen newspapers. By the end of that decade, Bloom County appeared in over 1,300 newspapers worldwide. Bloom County was originally set in the Bloom Boarding House, which was run by the grandparents of a 10-year-old newspaper reporter named Milo Bloom. And Milo was the original protagonist of the comic strip. Steve Dallas and Saigon John joined Bloom County in early 1981, with Saigon John being renamed to Cutter John, who it turns out was quite the Star Trek fan. Michael Binkley, a friend of Milo Bloom, showed up about the same time as a self-reflective character who had an anxiety closet, something that became a bit of a staple for the strip for many years to come. Oliver Wendell Jones was another classmate of Milo and Binkley. He was a computer hacker and a gifted scientist, and he was one of the first African-American characters to join the cast of Bloom County. There were multiple memorable characters that filled the panels of Bloom County, including Bobby Harlow, the feminist school teacher and one-time love interest of both Steve Dallas and John Cutter, Keish Lorraine, the cousin of Bobby Harlow, and also the one-time love interest of Steve Dallas, Lola Guranola, the free-spirited hippie, Milk Toast, the cockroach, Rosebud, the basilope, and Ronald Ann Smith, the innocent African-American little girl who was almost always found with her headless doll, Rinalda. But there were two residents of Bloom County that stood out from all the rest, Opus the Penguin and Bill the Cat. Opus the Penguin, although he was often mistaken for a puppet, was the lovable, huggable, constantly naive centerpiece of the comic strip. Opus was constantly in search to find his mother, with whom he was separated during the Falkland War. Opus was originally a pet of Binkley, but the character quickly evolved to the point that later Opus was the focus of two subsequent comic strips by Breathed, Outland, and the comic strip titled Opus. The second breakout character was Bill the Cat. Bill the Cat was introduced in 1982 as the upside-down version of Jim Davis's comic strip character Garfield. Bill the Cat was a background character during his early time in Bloom County and was actually killed off, allegedly due to a bad case of acne. But Breathed brought Bill the Cat back and his popularity slowly grew. Bill's inability to communicate outside of his signature ack and pfft sounds made him a blank slate against which all manner of wild storylines evolved. Bill was a cult member, a televangelist, a presidential candidate, a heavy metal rock star in the band Billy and the Boingers. And in the last three months of the series, Bill the Cat's brain was surgically replaced with the brain of one Donald J. Trump. A truly stupid storyline, even for the 1980s. Bloom County was an imaginative and creative world that was unlike any other comic strip to date. Well, except for Doonesbury, the comic strip that many critics and observers of the genre said Breathed stylistically ripped off in multiple ways when he created Bloom County. And Breathed admitted that he was influenced by Gary Trudeau's work, but over time, the two cartoonists became close friends. And when Bloom County's follow-up comic strip, Outland, ended its run, Steve Dallas came out of the closet, admitted he was gay, and married the Doonesbury character, Mark Slackmeyer. Bloom County contributed to the wave of New Age comic strips that fused political and pop culture references with social commentary and satire. Breathed ran a storyline that examined the impact of testing cosmetics on animals in laboratories. He dealt with feminist issues, political patronage, and for some readers of the comic strip series, they wanted these topics not on the funny pages, but over on the editorial pages of their local hometown newspapers. In 1987, Breathed won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. 
Established editorial cartoonists were pissed off that a daily comic strip artist was horning in on their craft of drawing an opaque visual reference of a bucket with a hole in it and a rain cloud with arrows pointing to depict the bucket uh, that says U.S. Deficit. And then there was another arrow labeling the storm cloud as George W. Bush's defense budget. See, that's funny, right? <laughs> it's a thinker. <laughs> Bloom County ran for nine years, ending in 1989 with Ronald Ann ushering the strip's biggest star, Opus, into the new world, Outland. Breathitt's Outland returned as a Sunday-only strip, and it featured some old and some new characters, but Opus was the real star of this imaginative new world, and it ran in newspapers until 1995. At the end of Outland's run, Breathitt turned his attention to writing children's books. The first book featured Opus the Penguin in A Wish for Wings That Worked, an Opus Christmas story. This was later turned into an animated TV special on the CBS network and was produced by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Television. Breathed published Red Ranger Came Calling in the year 2000, Edward Fudd Whopper Fit Big in 2003, Flawed Dogs. That same year in 2003, Breathed returned to the Sunday comic section with a comic strip titled Opus. The comic strip brought back fan favorites, including Steve Dallas and Bill the Cat. And since the strip was Sunday only, that meant he had to produce just four strips a month, which eased up the pressure of looming deadlines. Opus ran for five years, ending in November of 2008. At this time, the world was really changing as newspapers one by one were closing shop, reducing the readership of comic strip fans. During this time, Breathed continued writing, illustrating, and he published two more children's books. Pete and Pickles, the story of an unlikely friendship between an uptight pig and a free-spirited elephant. And the other children's book told the story of a boy who learns how much his mother truly loves him in 2007's Mars Needs Moms. Mars Needs Moms is truly a wonderful children's book that became one of the greatest cinematic bombs of all time. So how did this happen? Well, it all kind of starts with Robert Zemeckis, who was one of the most influential and innovative filmmakers of the 80s and 90s. He directed the Back to the Future trilogy, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Castaway, Death Becomes Her, Forrest Gump. These were all movies that meshed technology and live action filmmaking into a seamless cinematic experience that continued to set the bar higher and higher for how filmmakers can tell stories. Robert Zemeckis and Tom Hanks had a working relationship, and the two optioned the rights to Chris Van Allsburg's children's book, The Polar Express. Originally, they were going to make it as a live-action film, but this proved to be cost-prohibitive, and Zemeckis was intrigued by the emerging process of motion capture, where actors' movements were recorded and then later animated into a final film. Zemeckis pitched this as a way to bring the beloved Christmas-themed children's book to the screen, and in 2004, the movie premiere. Reviews for The Polar Express were mixed, with some critics noting the stunning visuals of the movie. However, the human characters were not exactly lifelike. They were borderline creepy looking. The character design was often criticized for dipping into the uncanny valley, which is a phenomenon where a computer-generated figure or humanoid robot, they bear near identical resemblance to humans, which creates a sense of unease or revulsion in the person viewing it. Rolling Stone movie critic Peter Travers called The Polar Express a failed and lifeless experiment in which everything goes wrong. Other reviews included comments like, I could probably have tolerated the incessant jitteriness of The Polar Express if the look of it didn't give me the creeps. <laughs> Another review read, if I were a child, I'd have nightmares. Come to think of it, I did anyway. I can't tell if they liked it or not. <laughs> the movie didn't perform as well as the filmmakers had hoped, but it did find legs in repeat showings as an IMAX experience in 3D in subsequent years, as did the popularity of the film once it was available for home viewing. The movie inspired local train operators to offer up Polar Express experiences, and the movie is now considered to be a holiday classic. Zemeckis' production company, Image Movers, saw the possibility in this type of filmmaking, and they went on to make another motion capture animated film titled Monster House. This film was directed by Gil Keenan, who would later go on to helm that Poltergeist remake. See Season 8, Episode 3 for more on that. And he also co-wrote Ghostbusters Afterlife with Jason Reitman, if you're scoring at home. Having delivered a somewhat success using motion capture technology on two films, Zemeckis decided to take another swing at bringing a literary classic to the big screen. 
with the adaptation of the Old English poem Beowulf. Zemeckis wrote the screenplay and with the help of author Neil Gaiman and screenwriter Roger Avery and with the voice acting talents of Ray Winstone, Anthony Hopkins, Robin Wright, John Malkovich, Crispin Glovin, and Angelina Jolie, wow, that's a cast, they produced a movie that was more widely praised by critics. But audiences didn't show up as expected once again, and the movie underperformed at the box office. About this time, Zemeckis' company, Image Movers, went into business with the Walt Disney Company to make 3D animated movies. Remember back when 3D was everywhere because of Avatar? All right, this happened during then. The first movie made by this joint venture was 2009's A Christmas Carol, based on the classic Charles Dickens novel, and it starred Jim Carrey, where he played Scrooge and all three ghosts, past, present, and future. The movie is a pretty faithful adaptation of the novel, and when it hit theaters, audiences just didn't show up. And due to high production costs and the marketing dollars behind it, A Christmas Carol lost an estimated 50 to 100 million bucks. However, that stinging setback wasn't the final nail in the coffin of Zemeckis' 3D motion capture animated movie dreams. That honor was left to the movie we're discussing in this episode, Mars Needs Moms. Mars Needs Moms was well into production before A Christmas Carol hit theaters with a thud. The movie was adapted from Berkeley Breathitt's children's book by Simon Wells, who also co-directed the movie with his wife, Wendy. Wells and Zemeckis had history working together on Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Back to the Future Part 2 and 3 and The Polar Express. Adapting The Polar Express was the real spark for Wells to suggest bringing Mars Needs Moms to the big screen. Wells had experience working on multiple animated films, including being the director of an American Tale 2, Five Old Goes West, and The Prince of Egypt. Wells did storyboard work on Shrek 2 and Over the Hedge. He was a supervisor on the action sequences in Kung Fu Panda, and he certainly seemed qualified to turn this beloved children's book into a film for the whole family. Now, let me just say, it's easier to make a good movie from a bad book. If you ever read Winston Groom's Forrest Gump or William Steig's Shrek, you know what I'm talking about. Turning a good book into a good movie is much more difficult, a, a task that was completely completely botched by the film adaptation of Mars Needs Moms. Berkeley Breathed said that the book's inspiration came from a real-life incident where his real-life son, who is named Milo, that's interesting, he refused to eat some broccoli. Breathed's wife came in and she dropped his PlayStation into the trash, to which Milo screamed, I wish I never had a mother. Mom burst into tears. Breathed found inspiration. Now, if you've never read Berkeley Breathed's children's book, Mars Needs Moms, let me sum up this 38 page turner, most of which are illustrated. The story is about a very young boy, Milo, who looks to maybe be about eight years old. And he's kind of a rotten kid who doesn't eat his broccoli. He refuses to take out the trash. He washes a younger sibling in purple pink dye and his mom sends him to bed and he mouths off that he doesn't see what's so special about moms. That night, aliens that look more like oversized, goofy, wide-eyed, misshapen gummy bears show up looking for a mom, something that they don't have on Mars. They just randomly show up at Milo's house and sneak off with his mom, who is still deeply asleep. Milo and his adorable dog follow the aliens. They leap onto a ladder outside of the spaceship as it takes off into space. Everybody lands on Mars, where we immediately find out that the aliens need a mom to take them to soccer and ballet practice and pack their lunches and put band-aids on their boo-boos. Milo, seeing this, realizes that his mom is pretty awesome. And then he immediately steps out of the spaceship and falls where his helmet that is giving him oxygen cracks on the ground and he is going to die. His mother comes over, takes off her helmet, puts it on her son, sacrificing herself for Milo, where we, the reader, get to see her beautiful, loving face for the very first time in this children's book. The aliens fetch another oxygen helmet. They return Milo and his mother back home. The two wake up and life is as it should be with a dopey dad in the background, none the wiser. Dads, what useless dopes. The story has hints of Maurice Syndax, where the wild things are. It's short, it's simple, it's sweet. It's cartoonish and filled with over-exaggerated facial expressions and wildly imaginative scenery that's full of color and merriment. There's really just three characters, Milo, the mom, and the aliens. So how do you take a short story really about a mother's never-ending love for her child and turn it into a feature-length film? Well, the first step is you ruin it with a bloated, overly complicated screenplay. For starters, the filmmakers came up with their own alien language. 
Really? You created your own alien language for this movie? And reportedly, actors spent a whole day recording different words and filmmakers picked their favorite versions and they documented the entire language. I'm sure they did. To play the characters of Milo, filmmakers cast Seth Green, hot off his role as Scott Evil in the Austin Powers movies, and also he was in his mid-30s. Once all of the motion capture work was done, filmmakers said he doesn't sound like a kid, so they brought in 12-year-old Seth Dusky to dub the voice of Milo. Joan Cusack was cast to play Milo's mom. Cusack is the voice of Jessie the Cowgirl in the Toy Story franchise, and she was known for her comedic performances in movies like Working Girl, and in and out she was also on saturday night live for one season remember that probably not to bloat out the story filmmakers added a new character for the movie named gribble as played by dan fogler who at the time had appeared in balls of fury and fanboys and he's currently in those harry potter spinoff movies about fantastic beasts where he plays jacob kowalski so mars needs mom is in production and the team behind the movie slowly figured out they were about to lay a big turn but why exact well for starters movie going audiences repeatedly had said no thank you to this style of animation when it came to spending their movie going dollars the people look creepy <laughs> they gave them film credit nightmares weren't you paying attention second analyst List of the film said having the word mom in the title is essentially kryptonite for young boys looking for action and adventure movies. Third, the movie's plot, which really details the abduction of a mother by these creepy looking aliens, not the cartoonish goofball gummy bear ones I was talking about. These things look weird. This was a more disturbing abduction of the mom than what is portrayed in the source material. So the movie hits theaters and it only made 39 million bucks against an estimated cost of 200 million bucks. It was a financial a disaster. Critics didn't like the movie and it currently has a 37% freshness rating over on Rotten Tomatoes. And the biggest complaint centered on the creepiness of the human characters. Brooks Barnes with the New York Times commented that critics and audiences alike, with audiences voicing their opinions on Twitter, blogs, and other social media, complained that the Zemeckis technique can result in character facial expressions that look unnatural. Another common criticism was that Mr. Zemeckis' focus on so much technological wizardry that he neglects storytelling. Now, apparently there is a cut of the movie somewhere on the internet where you can hear Seth Green voicing the original dialogue of Milo. If you're interested in doing that, please don't. Zemeckis' company, Image Movers Digital and Disney, they parted their ways after this disastrous movie hit theaters. Not that very many people ever saw this movie because it's terrible. Breathed said that Mars Needs Moms was built backward from a story beat that I as an author and especially as a parent found a devastating and emotional moment. The filmmakers could have lost sight of this easily and effortlessly as my son loses any money that I place in his pocket. And you know what? You could argue that some of those emotional beats from the book do find a place in the film. They're just surrounded by so much padding and wasted time and flat characters that it's difficult to find the signal in the noise or to have patience to stick around for them when they make themselves known. Breath had said that the filmmakers behind Mars Knees Moms had their own ideas for the film's creative direction and explored them without any of his input. <laughs> that explains a lot. For fans of Berkeley Breathed, there's some promising good news. Bloom County is currently in production to be an animated show on the Fox Network, and an adaptation of his children's book, Pete and Pickles, is being reimagined as a series called Hit Pig, with the voice talents of Peter Dinklage and Rain Wilson, Hannah Gadsby, and RuPaul. And Berkeley Breathed is actively involved in both of these productions, so we got that going for us. But if you can't wait for those two projects to show up in front of your eyeballs and you're looking for a good bedtime story to read to your little one, I highly recommend getting your hands on a copy of Mars Needs Moms. It's a delightful experience to share with a little one that you love, unlike the movie we're about to discuss. You know what? Let's get Bo in here to discuss this movie from beginning to end, top to bottom. Ladies and gentlemen, Moms and Milo's Pick 6 Movies brings you the mostly misinterpreted motion picture masterpiece of meh, 2011's Mars Needs Mobs. And 
Welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by my favorite space cadet, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? I'm happy to be journeying to the Red Planet, which is what I call the bathroom. You were one of the first people that I knew who owned a Bloom County t-shirt. You remember that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I Look, I've only had like 12 t-shirts in my entire life. Of course I remember. <laughs> yeah. You outgrow one, you get another. That's right. Recently, <laughs> I had to purchase a Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla shirt, which is a true story. What size should I order? Podcaster? Oh, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> that also is the same size as just middle aged. <laughs> yeah, Bloom County is uh, like, I love Bloom County. I still love Bloom County. We were talking about it off the air uh, the other day, and I was just musing about that whole bit where Steve Dallas tried to quit smoking, and it ends with him hopping up and down on a toilet that Opus is hiding inside, uh -huh. tied to a chair, <laughs> bouncing up and down on the toilet on one leg of the chair with an axe in his teeth and you could relate yeah yeah i mean i've been there uh, and, and, and the whole gag is like it's a, a an extended series throughout the the bloom county strips but the whole thing ends with sort of an omniscient narrator saying like eventually a substitute was found for the cravings and it's a final shot almost a ren and stimpy-esque like single frame of steve dallas with his belly just engorged with a ding dong shoved in his mouth and wrappers of junk food all around him as he is just passed out from eating this incredible amount of processed food to keep from having just that one more cigarette it's wonderful one of my favorite bloom county comic strips was where steve dallas is talking to his mother and she keeps using different phrases to refer to black people <laughs> it's, it's where steve dallas becomes you know kind of enlightened to social issues mm -hmm. he's like you know oh you can't say colored people she was like well like for the NAACP he's like no 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 you can't say that and it kind of goes through the evolution of what is an acceptable term for black people Berkeley Brethren had such a gift for tapping into these types of evolving social issues and pointing out you know the hypocrisy and the foibles and the silliness of it which was great because you know for a lot of listeners who don't remember the glory days of comic strips in newspapers I mean newspapers used to advertise that if you buy this newspaper you can read calvin and hobbs like going into bookstores which was you know a thing once upon a time dilbert collections and farside collections were regularly at the top of the new york Times bestseller list for months on end that people just devoured this type of media and it's it's just it, it's evolving times in fact i think that memes have really taken over what comic strips used to represent i suppose so. i mean that breaks my heart to even think about that because i i find memes as a rule to just be disgusting you know without the subtlety and nuance that a comic strip could bring uh and when i say nuance and subtle subtlety of course i'm talking about garfield like another <laughs> bloom county joke because eventually we're gonna have to talk about this movie and that's depressing i know and i'd rather talk about bloom county for the next hour and a half to two hours but i was also reminded this is another cigarette joke and maybe that's why i i <laughs> like carry these with me but do you remember when Opus the Penguin started smoking I do. in an effort to look more cool? Yes. There was a one strip in particular, because at, at the time he was working for uh, the Bloom County Picayune as, uh, the, <laughs> in the classified section. And... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the strip I'm talking I about do. already? I do. I know this one, yeah. Yeah, where he is taking the classified ad of this just gorgeous woman, and she is like, I, I want a short man, preferably somewhat round. A big <laughs> nose is preferable. And basically describes Opus the Penguin. But the last frame <laughs> is him breaking the fourth wall and looking to the audience and saying, no smokers at the same time she says no smokers and he's got a cigarette <laughs> hanging out of his mouth it's so good it's such a i mean it's almost like the cork in dirty rotten scoundrels <laughs> as far as just the construction of a joke where like oh of course and that was the thing that it was great about comic strips was you had this three panel or four panel beat to sell a joke and when i used to write and illustrate comic strips it was nice to have those parameters in which to work you have those guardrails like i can't go beyond this how do i pack this in, in in as tight a fashion as possible to make something pay off in the end berkeley breath did it as well if not better than anybody 
else, you know, that was out there. His children's books, as I noted, were also incredibly well done. This is a terrible adaptation, as we're about to get into. And one of the things that I found is that, you know, there are a lot of adaptations of children's books to feature films. Some of them are good. Most of them are bad. Jim Carrey's The Grinch is a mess. Please see season four, episode one on that one. Mr. Popper's Penguins and Lemony Snicket's series of unfortunate events both also starred Jim Carrey and were not very good. But all children's book movie adaptations that star Jim Carrey are not terrible because he did voice Horton in the animated adaptation of Horton Hears a Who that I will happily argue is a film that is better than its source material. Hmm, okay. Yeah. I mostly know Horton Hears a Who as a line from the song Groove is in the Heart. I like the lesser known sequel to that. Horton Hears a Huh? <laughs> Horton Hears a What? <laughs> Horton Hears a <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, as I get older, perhaps I'm just wrapping around, you know, it's that, that old adage, you know, you start off as a child and you end up that way too. And I have really embraced a well-timed and well-placed fart sound uh -huh. in my entertainment. Sure. That has nothing. I'm just doing anything I can to avoid talking about this movie. Mike Myers was in that cat in the hat adaptation. That's a real fever dream of a movie. If you've never seen it, it is so bizarre that I almost enjoy watching it. I I saw that in the theater for free because I had a coupon. It reminds me of that Dana Carvey variety half hour show that he had. Like, it's <laughs> so insane that you can't imagine how this movie was actually made. Have you seen Mike Myers' Cat in the Hat? I've only seen it the one time that it was featured in the boat sequence of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. No, 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 no. That, that's not it. That is, that's not it. No, There's no, 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 no. Chicken no, 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 no. Bo, at okay. one point in this movie, the cat Cat in the Hat gets hit in the dick with a baseball bat by a kid that may or may not have Down syndrome. And the pain is so severe when the Cat in the Hat gets hit in the dick because they think he's a pinata that we go inside the mind of the Cat in the Hat and the pain is so severe that the way it manifests itself within his mental faculties is that we see the cat in the hat now wearing a Cupid doll outfit, riding a tree swing, slowly swaying in the breeze as glitter snowfall drifts down from the sky while a unicorn eats grass in the background and we hear Lionel Richie singing Easy Like Sunday Morning. <laughs> That's certainly odd. Someone thought of this. Someone wrote this down. They got a, a Mike Myers sized Cupid doll outfit. They got a horse that they stuck a fake unicorn horn on. They got the rights to the Commodore's <laughs> Easy Like Sunday Morning and they filmed this. That joke cost at least $200,000. When I saw it in the theater, I lost my mind. It was one of the funniest things that I'd ever seen. This is amazing. Core Caroline and Matilda are two children's book adaptations that I will put in the pile of this is quite good. Oh, Coraline's fantastic. And and some good they might be giants snuck into that as well. D and Danny DeVito both is in front of and behind the camera on Matilda. And it's a wonderful adaptation of that. This movie, Mars Needs Moms. As I mm -hmm. mentioned in the introduction, certainly has whiffs of Maury Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, which I will also say is a film adaptation led by Spike Jones. that is a masterclass in how you take a children's book, dig deep and find the inner soul of the text and really bring that to life. Also, Spike Jones produced a 40 minute documentary where he sits and talks with Maury Sendak. It's called Tell Them Anything You Want, a portrait of Maury Sendak. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is enlightening. It's heartbreaking. It is a thing of beauty where this fantastic filmmaker interviews a brilliant author and illustrator. It's just wonderful. So go watch that and don't watch Mars Needs Moms. I think we can get that out of the way right now. You should never, ever watch this movie. Well, hell, it's on a season called Bombs Away. We're talking about some of the shittiest movies ever made. Did you even know that this book existed before I teed this up as a episode for this season? I had heard about this movie. Like, I was aware of it, of just being a Berkeley Breath adaptation, I've never read the book, but I, I was vaguely aware of it, yeah. You knew of the movie? Yeah. I'd never seen it till we talked about doing it for this season, because I knew that it was terrible, and I'd read the book, and the book is quite good, and I knew that the movie would be quite bad, therefore, I did not see it. I like that this movie has a runtime of 92 minutes, but the last nine minutes are credits, accompanied by footage of all the actors doing motion capture. Yeah. So we're down to 83. If you shave off the first 
60 seconds of company logos and who cares. We're down to 82 minutes. That's lifetime movie length, Mo. <laughs> yeah, but a lifetime movie actually has stuff that happens in a, in a way that I kind of want to. You're missing the murder and the incest and <laughs> the, the syphilis in school and all this stuff. Like, oh, what I wouldn't give Chad for a lifetime movie about 30 minutes into Mars Needs Moms. Yeah, you give me any cheerleader scheming to kill another and I would have been a happy guy. All right. Well, the bad news is we got to talk about this movie. Our movie starts off and immediately makes its first of many mistakes as it shows the Mars rover doing its thing on the red planet. Thus, Bo, setting this movie in the real world, which it should not be. This came out in, what, 2011? We didn't need to set this against the backdrop of a year where Charlie Sheen was having his meltdown and James Franco and Anne Hathaway were awkwardly hosting the Oscars. Kim Kardashian getting her first divorce and Angry Birds is all the rage. This movie should be set in a fantastical world, not the world of crazy nonsense that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We go to the movies for escapism, Bo. I don't disagree with you. There is too much realism in this movie tucked into all the little corners of it for it to be the fantastical and colorful and silly thing that it kind of needs to be to be a successful movie. And yes, instead it opens up on the honest to goodness Mars Rover taking a, a sample of a rock. And the first thing that you really get thrown at your eyeballs in this movie is you kind of, you know, as the viewer, you're descending below the surface mm -hmm. of Mars. Right. And this furry ass comes out of the ground. And you realize, like, oh, not only is there one hairy ass coming out of the ground, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. This is a movie for perverts. <laughs> these things that pop out of the ground. They look like these grayscale versions of Chaka from Land of the Lost. Yeah. <laughs> and watching all this on a video screen is a character named Key, who's very curious about what's happening. And there's a woman beside her who is known as the supervisor. And she comes over and Key bows down in subservience. And I kind of teased this on the last episode. But I think that this is the most misogynistic movie I may have ever seen. I don't know what kind of issues writer, director Simon Wells had with his mother or his wife or his sisters or his female school teachers, but it seems that in this humble podcaster's opinion, Mr. Wells is working through some shit in this movie. I don't think he likes anybody because I don't think men come off any better. But women come off worse. Yeah, it, it's just kind of regressive. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it down the road, but the overarching idea seems to be that women shouldn't even have the option to take care of children. When the supervisor comes over and you really get a good look at her, her head looks like testicles, like a testicle outside of its normal scrotal sack. <laughs> like it's unwrapped soon to be withered testicle i reminded me of the aliens from war of the worlds i thought she was like et but you remove all the lovable sweetness and then you turn down all of the facial features to make her constantly look angry and also combine that with a giant testicle and then you have the lead female character who is known as the supervisor sure like she doesn't even have a name Bo. she's just called the supervisor <laughs> and while you're at it get Give them goat hooves just to make them the most diabolical creatures you ever saw in your life. The supervisor is voiced in her native make em up alien language by Mindy Sterling, who was the always screaming Frau Farbissina in the Austin Powers movies. She's always screaming in this movie and talking in abusive tones. Yeah, I would have said that it was Eartha Kitt not knowing any better, but it's that kind of vibe to the voice. <laughs> it's the real Scott! Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of that so and and also in the front end of this they're all just talking martian to each other mm -hmm. and nothing sucks you into a movie more than a language you can't understand and creatures that are off-putting and don't give us any subtitles it's just right make them up nonsense key fires up the computer and they start scanning planet earth and they zoom in on a terrible mother being quite awful at the job of parenting and this first mother is buying her shitty daughter an ice cream cone mm -hmm. and this little girl she just throws it to the ground and the mom immediately buys her daughter two more cones to replace the one that this piece of shit kid just spiked on the sidewalk look i'm a parent and one thing i don't do is ever give advice on how you should raise your kid i never hit my kid as a form of punishment mm -hmm. i accidentally popped him in the mouth once while we were swimming in a pool and that's how he <laughs> lost his first tooth or at least that's what we're telling him but if my kid pulled shit like this oh i wouldn't hit my son bow 
That's too easy. I would find the thing that he loved most in the world and I would destroy it in front of him. I like that your vengeance is more esoteric mm-hmm. and thus a little more like soul rending yes. than just a one across the chops. Uh, I can respect that. Welcome to the Cooper Hassle. <laughs> to paraphrase John Lennon, it's more than mind games. Yeah, my kid's like, if you're lucky, he'll hit you. <laughs> <laughs> right oh what i wouldn't give for just a knuckle sandwich and so after leaving this shitty mom we go to another shitty bob because the supervisor is like ah! <laughs> we cut to this other lady who's just playing around with her kids in the park i don't think she's playing i think they're being assholes and she's trying to keep them in line i look i'm not a parent chad i don't know these are shitty kids because the supervisor's like ah! Ah! scott <laughs> <laughs> right. it is mars attacks we're, we're, this season has a lot of mars in it with, and apologies in advance so we, then we cut to yet another mom with a shitty kid but this is our main shitty kid of the movie milo and it's joan cusack being like what do i have to do you need to take out this garbage milo he takes this garbage out onto the front porch and he goes like two paces and he just sits down on the stoop refusing to walk four more steps and put it in the garbage can milo is a lazy piece of shit kid the only time he shows any can-do spirit is when his mother's life is on the line and that's a really selfish motive motivation because he's not so much concerned about saving her life as he is just not living with that guilt but the supervisor is like ah, ah. and apparently she likes joan cusack and so this big target forms on joan cusack's head i've got to say i do not like the image motion style of animation i find it very off-putting sure because it's off-putting, Bo. Yes, the Joan Cusack animation is the worst of it. It looks a little too rubbery, but also it's like if a mannequin came to life. And it's just a, a an abomination to God and man. When the supervisor gives a thumbs up with her, ack, ack, she walks away and Key rolls her eyes. So you know that Key kind of has issues with the supervisor. And then the camera fades into this black and white monitor. And then it turns to color. And we see that Milo's mom is still bitching at milo for being a lazy piece of shit the mom was like was that so hard and milo says every day with the trash what's the big deal why don't they take a trash every day mom imagine what the world would be like if nobody took out the trash i'd be awesome that would be what it would be like and you know what you suck you're terrible i hate taking out your trash the phone rings uh-huh. and she's like could you at least answer the phone, Milo? Are you kidding me? Do I have to do everything around here? This is bullshit. What do I do? Answering service around here? I'm going to run away and join the circus and go sell drugs and start a band and become a tattoo artist and bang hot chicks someday. When he answers the phone. Hello, Stromboli Slave Shack, disrespectful child speaking. His dad on the other end, played by Tom Everett Scott mm-hmm. in a role that you could do in about 45 <laughs> I minutes. Say, I thought you were going to say 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've given him time to re-record a couple of these <laughs> gems. How did he not become a bigger actor? Because he's not very good. Oh, okay, that's it. Yeah. He's got one note. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that American Werewolf in Paris. It turns out that is not the note he can do. Anyway, he is trapped at an airport. And hey, Milo's buddy. Like, what? What the fuck? Wait a minute, you're supposed to be here so I can go to this zombie movie. This is fucked up, Dad. Hold on, pal. Hold on. Hold on. I know I promised I'd be home, but uh, I'm uh, I'm stuck. There's a snowstorm, uh, I guess. Um, tell your mom that my flight was canceled and I'm not going to be home to keep any of my promises to you or her, uh, including my wedding vows. I told my kid to tell her I won't be home soon. Yeah, this is a guy who definitely takes a couple of laps around the block before pulling in the driveway, <laughs> knowing what's waiting for him behind that front door (laughs) milo's mom walks in and she takes the phone from milo and she continues talking but when milo was talking to the dad on the phone we could hear the dad's part of the conversation but when milo's mom is talking to the dad we don't hear it at all that's because milo's dad hung up and she's just talking (laughs) into the phone receiver she's like "Uh uh-huh oh no yeah well you know what maybe he could watch zombie dawn three non-pay-per-view if he eats all of his dinner including his vegetables how about that wink wink i love you too 
too. No, this has been the best decision I ever made in my whole life, Mary and you. <laughs> if you'd like to make a call, please hang up and dial again. M- Milo starts to jump around. He's like, yeah, that is awesome. If you hadn't gotten that flight delay, then you would have never made such a dad-inspired alternative to not going to the movies. Your awesome husband, dad, is the best dad of the year. You suck. The deal is, I'll let you watch Zombie Dawn 3 on pay-per-view, but you gotta clean your plate, Milo. Whatever you say. Cut to dinner, where he is clearly not eating the broccoli, because he's like, this broccoli sucks. You gotta eat your broccoli if you want to watch Zombie Attack 3 or whatever it is on the pay-per-view. All right, dear Milo? Yeah, I got you. Uh, Hey, how about you look over there for a minute? Come here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And so (laughs) he feeds the cat his broccoli Uh so he can watch this movie. Dude, I found it more plausible that all of these people end up in outer space (laughs) than I did the idea of seeing a cat actually eat broccoli. You're not wrong. (laughs) That was one of the first moments where I realized that we were watching a fantasy. It's like watching any bobby pins. Right. A bug, a mouse. (laughs) Sure. A piece of shit. Yeah. I would believe that over broccoli. A fern. The remote held the TV. Like, that cat ate the entire television. I don't have a single complete electrical cord in my home (laughs) because the cat has chewed through all of it. But broccoli? No, sir. Because cats are jerks, Milo's cat polishes off the broccoli and then immediately throws it up because i think this cat forced itself to consume the broccoli just so it could throw it up and sell out milo <laughs> that's a pretty good plan like it had no intention of digesting this food which makes it the character i respect most in this film milo's mom comes in and points at the vomit and she says milo is that broccoli no that's cat vomit but i can understand your confusion stupid that's it, Milo. I've had enough of you. Go to bed. Fine, I'll go to bed. You suck. I got a TV in my room. You don't think I know the code for pay-per-view? <laughs> it's your stupid birthday, you stupid bitch. He goes upstairs, and this piece of shit kid just peels off his clothes and leaves a trail of dirty laundry to his room, where his mom finds him and picks him up. And when she opens the door, he's just bouncing up and down on the mattress, and Milo's mom says, Look, mister, I told you to go to bed. Oh, uh, no, you, you told me to go to bed. You didn't say to get into bed and go to sleep there's a difference maybe you should eat some broccoli and get something that looks like a brain in your stupid head you dummy i like the fact one of the few moments of this movie i genuinely like is when joan cusack is like you know my life would be a whole lot better if you didn't force me into this position where i gotta be a nagging mom and you weren't such a piece of shit oh yeah well my life would be better if i didn't have a mom at all yeah i'm talking to you yeah oh did you cry (laughs) baby want to cry about that the camera cuts back to his mom who rightfully looks very hurt and bo we see a single tear pour down her cheek and for what it's worth didn't we learn this lesson already in home alone i don't know i didn't learn any lessons watching home alone (laughs) other than to check door handles for heat like lick your fingers and give it a little tappity tap tap uh yeah (laughs) joe cusack obviously is very upset by this she just closes the door milo is like yeah get out of here that's right i'm gonna sit here and read a comic book or at least i'm gonna look at the pictures i don't know what the big words say i haven't learned to read because reading's for chumps and nerds just like you mom mom you're a nerd i saw you reading at better homes and gardens so stupid reading the music tells us that this is a real sad moment in our movie and milo's laying in bed and he starts to regret maybe what he said for a moment he looks down at their cat and he says oh man cujo wake up i can't sleep which two things about first their cat's name is cujo you can't name your pet cujo without it being a constant reminder to others of how quirky you are as a person and second when you can't sleep and you wake someone else up to tell them you can't sleep you're an asshole milo says to the cat hey cujo you know i'm feeling what's that word that you say when you say something stupid to your stupid mom and it makes her upset and she feels bad for it uh what's the word humiliate no that's not it gaslight <laughs> uh, come on, think. berate, belittle, ugh, apologies, apologies. That's what I'm going to do, Cujo. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to do at least two of those things to my mom. I'm going to apologize <laughs> right across to the bridge of her nose, cat. And then here, the movie makes a real point of showing Milo putting on his sneakers. You know, like most kids do when they get out of bed to walk down the hall in their pajamas to talk to their parents. It's so strange. Again, taking notes on this movie, the first time I watched it, I was too shocked by how off-putting all of this is to pay attention to that detail. 
detail, but getting out of bed and immediately putting on shoes is some of the strangest child behavior I've ever seen in my life. The house is freakishly clean, like OCD clean. Uh huh. So you might be able to make the argument that they have house rules like Fred Rogers, like you take off your outside shoes, come in the house and put on your inside shoes so that your dirty stank feet don't mess up the clean house. But that's not what's <laughs> going on. They just doing this so yeah. that later in the movie, he's not running around barefoot and running across broken shards of metal and glass. And yeah, it just becomes the second half of Die Hard right. where his feet are all bloody and he's got a shirt wrapped around one foot because he had to yank some metal out of it. You PKA motherfucker. I'm talking to you, mom. I'm on the side of the Martians. If I had the chance, I'd help Hans Gruber. <laughs> he had a pretty good plan. Milo goes downstairs, but his mom's not there. So he goes up to her bedroom, which is upstairs, and he sees a strange light under the door. He enters the bedroom where there are two double doors that exit out onto a balcony and they're open. And some strange lights are flying away in the sky. One assumes with his mother now abducted. Milo runs through a cornfield in their backyard, which I was like, do they live on a farm? They live in the house from uh, Signs. <laughs> Swing away, Milo. Katow! Right in the head. Now that would be a movie. Take that cat in the hat shit, wrap it up with this, let him bash some brains, crack these yeah. testicle heads right open. You want to make this a better movie? You cram that racist Mel Gibson son of a bitch into this too. And How is he still in movies? I don't know. It blows my mind. Every time I see <laughs> it, his name in the credits of something, I'm like, I don't think it's okay to have him in movies still. And maybe, call me old fashioned, but you both act racist and sexist i don't care how good a beard you can grow and that was his move right is he just grew a beard like we wouldn't recognize him anymore <laughs> as the guy who called that police officer sugar tits remember the audio tapes of him screaming at his wife or girlfriend about how she should just shut up and smile and blow him yeah and like, and his father's a famous anti-Semite as well. How is he in so, movies? I don't know. Like Frank Langella just got escorted off the set of that new Mike Flanagan show for grabbing people's ass or whatever. And Mel Gibson is allowed to roam free in Hollywood. I'm not saying I'm surprised that Frank Langella was trying to grab a little ass. I'm saying that I'm surprised that Mel Gibson is not treated similarly. That's the point. Out in the woods, Milo comes across a spaceship that looks like a three-story tall bullet. It's got a glass open opening at the top where we see Milo's mom still asleep but strapped to what looks like an upright operating table. Milo runs over and he starts beating on the spaceship with his fist screaming, let my mom go! Because if she's not here, who am I going to make feel like a piece of shit all the time? Who's going to make all my food, huh? Are you going to come back and do it, you stupid aliens? She changes the Wi-Fi password every night. I don't know what it is for tomorrow. How am I going to look at porno? You guys suck. She's got it written on the fridge, but I can't read. I don't know the difference between letters and numbers or shapes <laughs> the only thing i understand is that egyptian language you know with like cats and birds walking backwards and stuff and by that i can say that's a cat and that's a bird he's walking backwards the spaceship takes off yeah and milo's yellow hoodie gets caught on some landing pad gear and then he gets pulled up into the air as the spaceship makes its way up into the sky and milo says for those members of the audience who are visually impaired whoa i'm in a spaceship this is so cool <laughs> <laughs> which this movie explains itself all the time well it's got to in some cases because it's building up this entire mythology about the entire planet of mars but first the ship rockets through space milo blacks out due to what lack of oxygen and he dies did this kid just keel over in front of us i assumed he was just taking a nap like well i'm not gonna do anything till i get to mars so time for a quick shut eye stupid mom yeah they just they zip zap through space yeah immediately traverse 34 million miles from earth to mars yeah like a wormhole opens up bada bing bada boom we're at mars right so i'm okay with that this movie should really be less reality bound as we mentioned earlier so i was okay with wormhole nonsense so let's get things about 30 times more complicated than they need to be please so the ship lands yep this big tower rises out of the ground uh-huh and then another building rises out of the ground also yes it's like a a raised platform yeah kind of this squat one-story building and it's here that the supervisor and a bunch of her attendants and some guards put on some helmets and come out uh -huh. again because we don't have any subtitles or anything the supervisor sees this flower graffiti on the building yep and just goes <laughs> 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 
<laughs> R.I.P. Gilbert Godfrey. We see that Milo's mom is being taken away in a tube. We also find out here that the whole planet is ruled by women, and that this high priestess, the supervisor, is the grand poobah of the No Fun Club. We'll get to this on the back end, but I don't understand how she came to power, and that nobody knows that. Well, all you need to know, Bo, is that Mars is ruled by women, women are in charge of everything, and that this world sucks, and there's no fun or joy or color or love when women are in charge <laughs> right so milo gets stuck in this two pod thing as well and then the whole ship sinks into the ground so milo wakes up alone in this pod like a prison cell as it turns out well they find him and they transport him to a prison cell when he wakes up there's a second where he can't figure out the gravity and he's bouncing all over the room whoa i'm a superhero i must have been bitten by one of them spiders or something this is totally badass Look at me, Spider Milo, Spider Milo. I'm totally badass. My mom sucks. <laughs> and so his pod door opens up and he steps out into this hallway, which is just a bunch of other similar pods. Hello? Has anyone seen my mom? I need to tell her she sucks. <laughs> Lights start shutting off in yeah. this thump, hallway thump, and he thump, starts running thump. from, you know, the, the coming darkness. And you hear this voice go, hey, bro, uh, you're going to watch jump down shoot number three. Who's that? You suck. Hey, amigo, look, ask me no questions. I'll tell you you know lies jump down shoot number three you're gonna be riders ring and he doesn't do it obviously until, until some aliens show up and are like bah, 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 and start shooting at him again <laughs> jesus christ they've got guns guns suck. what shoot did you say number three amigo oh shit all right here i go and so he jumps down this chute and it turns out it's this big slide that leads down into the bowels of mars which is just where the people People who live in these buildings up above dump all their shit. It's a world of trash. Yeah. Milo actually says, hey, this is a world of trash. This is awesome. <laughs> And you're like, what? It's the opening of Wally, -E, where they're like they, yeah. these big claws coming down to grab a bunch of garbage and throw it in these craters filled with lava or something. Which, by the way, Wally -E came out three years before this movie. That's not surprising. And <laughs> Milo ends up tumbling down this mountain of garbage and sees a bunch of furry Martians who are dressed up like. Mm, a group of college kids going to Lollapalooza. They look like the female Martian, but they have these crazy colorful clothes and they have long dreadlocks for hair. You're right. And they're wearing Bajas and playing hacky sack and talking about how cool Dave Matthews band is. <laughs> <laughs> Milo says, oh my God, are you zombies? Don't come any closer because I know karate, at least on my Wii. That's an early 2000s reference. Look, dummies, I'm looking for my mom. She's the one who feeds me. And he kind of pantomimes putting food in his mouth. All the Martians mimic his actions of putting a fork up to your lips. And then Milo says, no, dummies. I'm looking for my stupid mom. She's the one who washes my clothes and gets the shit stains out of my dirty underwear. And he bends over and pretends to put clothes in a washing machine. And all the Martians you know imitate him and he's like no you stupid morons I'm looking for my dumb stupid mom she vacuums the house like this it's all she does and then the martians imitate him and they're kind of doing a little dance like they're vacuuming and i was like wait the three things that milo used to identify his mother is that she cooks him food mm -hmm. she washes his shitty underwear mm -hmm. and she vacuums the house that's right there's nothing about her physical appearance like her age her height her hair color the last thing he says is no you stupid hairy assholes she hugs me like this she tucks me in at night yeah and they're like oh hugging we know that so they all hug him he's like get off me you hairy dickheads spoilers look let's just jump ahead all of these hacky sack loving free love giving martians are the male martians that have been exiled down into the shit bowels of the planet all right, right. they are sent here to live in trash piles by all of the women who run mars and it is the men it turns out Bo, who are the compassionate love Loving ones who are full of life and they show affection. It's not the women of Mars, Bo, who are cold and domineering and soul crushing. I don't think you're wrong about that. But the counter argument is they're also utter morons. 
to the point that they can't figure out basic shit when shown a shoot later in the movie they're just like i don't know that's why i think this movie doesn't like anybody yes it's misogynistic but it doesn't have a lot of great things to say about the men in this movie either i think it hates women Uh and it hates women so much that the perception of the female martians in this that are projected onto men is like a multiplier they are the ones who are exiling them and saying men suck they're terrible which in return makes the women seem even more terrible than they already are but they're not wrong the men do suck and they're terrible but when they're babies they throw them into trash piles and they grow up stupid but they're loving and they're kind and caring that doesn't make them necessarily good people milo is snatched up by this robot named two cat it's like a spider cat thing from now what was the michael crichton movie runaway stay tuned for that one ladies and gentlemen it's only a matter of time (laughs) oh yes i do it has almost made it to a list a couple of times That movie Tom is... Selleck fighting sentient robot spider somethings? A spider somethings, heat-seeking bullets, and most importantly, Chad, Gene Simmons. Oh, that's right. He is in that. Uh, he's the the heavy in that. So, yes. <laughs> yes. We will get to that. Toucat, <laughs> the robot, basically farts out this hot air balloon that lifts Milo up, and he is taken to... Essentially, it's like the Ewok village, only made of trash. It's like this clubhouse up in the sky. In this clubhouse, there is a fat guy playing this flight simulator. Mm Mm-hmm who we learn is Gribble, Mm -hmm. who is the guy that was like, yo, bro, you're going to want to take that number three trash shoot. Except he has gone bananas, Chad. Yeah. This is a crazy person living on Mars, surrounded by moron furry Martians. He's playing this video game and he says, hey, champ, you like Flight Simulator? I coded it from the manual. It's like the original. Oh, hey, look, dude, I was funning with you earlier because you're a human. It's been a long time since I've seen another person from earth let alone a kid my name's gribble and i suffer from arrested development that's why i said i haven't seen another kid in a long time i think of myself as a kid and my name's gribble that's my handle what's your handle maverick wolfman Iceman? man did you see the 1986 classic movie top gun that's what i was referencing because i make a lot of 80s references in this movie i explain everything with my dialogue as well also you might wonder where i came from and i came from ronald reagan's secret space force we were sent to mars because we proved to be absolutely batshit we were called the synchronauts and that's why i'm here and milo's like no jerkwad my name's milo i'm a person not an alien also how do you breathe how did you get here what do you eat how many times have you attempted suicide it turns out brother you can eat your own feces up to four times what you eat your own shit oh that's awesome and disgusting you might be the greatest worst person i've ever met since my mom i put black pepper on it and it really Uh spices it up really it's quite good I'll tell you what. Hey, man, once you come down here, I got this whole fire pole situation. Let me show you this bedroom down here, man. Once I figured out you were going to be on this planet, I set you up with a bedroom, which is going to be awesome. Wait, hold on a minute. You built a guest bedroom and you haven't seen somebody in like 25, 30 years? Well, I was going to make this guest room for my buddy Wingnut here, who's one of them hairy Martians. Right. I saw them down there. Yeah. That was weird. Yeah. He's an idiot. The fact that you can you know speak a language i can understand Uh gets you guest room privileges over that furry little bastard anyway here's your room it's basically a hammock and a bunch of garbage because that's all that exists on this planet (laughs) if gribble got snatched up from earth in like 86 because he makes some references to the greatest volleyball movie of all time aka top Mm -hmm. and earlier when milo leaves his bedroom we see that there is an incredibles movie poster on his walls which came out in 2004 so we're talking about like a 20 year gap Mm -hmm. so if gribble which we're going to find out later was snatched up as a kid that was 20 years ago so this guy is in his what 30s why does he not look like walt whitman or william gaines his character design looks more like john candy jr he probably has one of the aliens shave him probably taught him that basic function he gets (laughs) waiting up there he's like hey man go with the grain 
Grain. Go with the grain. Also, I'm going to need you to uh, spin around and bend over because Gribble's got to dribble, if you know what I mean. That's gross. <laughs> this movie is so based in reality, it makes it difficult to believe. And Gribble's character, as this strange man child, he's almost like if you'd watched Guardians of the Galaxy and Peter Quill ran around the movie acting like a manic, depressive Pee Wee Herman. That's what you get with Gribble. Yeah, if he was in no way heroic and was manipulative and shady. Yeah. And desperate for a physical and emotional connection. And is horny to a level that is tough to convey. It's like he goes completely around the horn and is back up at the top of the horniness scale. Yeah. Like, he will fuck anything. It does not matter what species it is. I think gender is a real roll of the dice as well. If there's some heat in the hole, Gribble's gonna drip. <laughs> so... <laughs> that ought to be the t-shirt that we finally sell for pick six <laughs> movies merch is gribbles got a dribble but yeah so he gives milo this bell he's like hey man this is gonna keep you from bouncing all over the place and save the animators a whole lot of trouble so uh hey let's go back up this here pole if you want to grind against it on the way up that's what gribble does brother how bad does gribble smell <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he has no toiletries or deodorant or soap. He lives in trash. <laughs> Where does he shit? How often does he wipe himself? Just right over the side, brother. I just squat right over the edge of my little lean-to here, and I'll let her go. <laughs> them, them turds reach terminal velocity before they splat. His oral hygiene has just got to be absent, right? The moral <laughs> caliber of this gentleman, which we'll get to here in a second, is only <laughs> matched by his stench. He smells bad both spiritually <laughs> and physically. And it's just, as we pointed out, off his nut and just to repeat from the introduction this is not a character from the book this is just in the movie as is key and as is the supervisor none of these characters exist <laughs> milo and his mom are the only two that get ported over he like fucks around with this control panel back up in in his control center and a bunch of aliens fall out of this pod into a pile that they get all tangled up with each other he's like yeah brother i have tapped in to their computer system and i can do all kinds of weird shit to these people and he watches all this on a bay of monitors yeah like he's at nasa or something more like he's howard hughes and then gribble goes hey man check this out put this headgear on top of your melon dude it translates martian speak into english and i'm like hold on so gribble a man with a 10th grade education listened to and translated another language and then made a device that automatically translated that to English? Mm -hmm. For who, Bo, and why? If he understands their language, that just makes him bilingual. There's no reason for him to build a device. For what? So in case somebody shows up who can't speak Martian in this crappy movie based on a children's book? Hey, man, put this on your head. Now you'll know what they're talking about. One assumes? I don't know, Chad. I don't know why he did this. What I do know is that his offer to Milo here is, listen, brother, I got this all plotted out. What we are going to do is play video games all day and all night and then watch TV and we'll just pass out once we have reached that point where we crank it a couple of times and just fall asleep either watching TV or playing video games. What TV are they watching? Surveillance footage? That's just nonstop interpretive narrative on the part of the viewer. That's too much work if you ask me bo they're gonna take a mystery science theater riff approach to it <laughs> assign them you know personalities and whatnot start selling audio i call it gribble tracks it's <laughs> kind of a play on words because the the logo is you know dribbles of drop gribble's gonna dribble that where i'm tying it in but anyway you can hear me in my pithy comments my hilarious commentary on on all these female aliens you know how women suck right oh dude don't get me started my mom's the worst hey there she is on tv right now what's she doing on tv she sucks if anybody should be on tv it's me i'm awesome i should have my own show hey man we don't need to worry about your mom all right because you know what i said about video games and whatnot and then milo overhears a couple of the aliens talk and because he's got the translator on, he makes out that they're, somebody says the word terminating. They're going to terminate my mom? And Gribble says, hey, brother, like Terminator. They're going to put her in a Terminator movie. I came out in 84 before I got sucked up into space. 84, remember that? McDLT and Teddy Rubskins and shit. The 80s were awesome, bro. Look, uh, here's the situation. Mars needs moms. Yeah, that's the title of the movie, and I got to say it's pretty cool, brother. Anyway, what happens is these Martians have these... Uh, 
babies. They call them hatchlings, you know, like little baby ducks. All right. These baby Martians that come out of the ground, well, it turns out Martians suck at being mothers, dude. Dude, you know who sucks at being a mom? My mom. Despite the fact that the women are kind of in charge here, uh -huh. they don't raise any of these kids. Right. They build nanny bods. What? Like Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons? Kinda, but mostly just focused on kids. Like boys and girls? Well, mostly girls. The boys, they just kind of flush. What? Like they have abortions and just flush them down the toilet? I mean, kinda. They're really, really late term abortions. I mean, they actually have the babies, but then they throw them away. It's a real messed up conservative world that we live in here on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to get one of these nanny bots down here to see if it's got an extra hole in the back. You know what I'm saying? Cause you know me, gribble gonna dribble. <laughs> And, but what they got to do is they got to program these nanny bots. And instead of using, I don't know, computers and codes and shit, they want to get a mother that knows order and discipline. Where are they going to find somebody like that? Well, it turns out that let's say you're a challenging child. Uh -huh. Your mom knows about discipline. Wait, my mom? Yeah. So in fact, hey, I've been watching some memories uh, because they extract the memories out of, out of your mom. Let me hold on. Let me change the channel real quick. Hey, look at this. It, it's her yelling at you about some shit you did. Oh, I remember that. That was every day. So they got this machine, right? That takes uh -huh. all the discipline out of a mom. Copy and paste, that kind of thing. Yeah. And it puts it in these nanny bots. All right. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that it puts a little of that MILF sexiness in them too. But, you know, like I said, been hard to get my hands on one of them nanny bots. They are fooling around with them kids all the time. And I don't get up top too much. But anyway, as soon as the sun comes up, right. this whole process is done. Uh-huh. And your mom, her, let's just say she is not going to be around to worry about. So we can get to them video games now. In fact, I'll tell you what, man, as a little show of good faith, here's this watch that it counts down till sunrise. This is sweet. I know. This is another Gribble special. Right? You got about seven hours till sunrise. Oh, man. Anyway, I'll tell you what, man. You want to go after your mom? I had myself a change of heart. Forget all what I said about all that TV and video games and stuff. Uh-huh. How about you go up there, you save your mom, and it's going to be Gribble-tastic. If something were to happen to my mom, I wouldn't have anybody to constantly shit on and make feel terrible. Yeah. You got a good point. I should go save her. You totally should, brother. And I'll tell you what, when you get done saving your mom, you just give me a jingle. I'll be down here with this hairy son of a bitch that won't leave my house playing some video games, probably watching some more TV. Uh, here in a minute, I'll, I'm going to switch over to the bathroom cam. Probably best you weren't around for that one anyway, my man. I'm going to do you a solid. Here's a terrible Martian disguise. Put this on. Hop on that elevator over there. It's going to take you topside. Get out there and save your mom. Also, brother, I forgot to mention there's this group called the sis you can think about that it's like short for sister they're the supervisor secret police and they're gonna probably try to kill you so don't let them do that so i gotta go save my mom so i have somebody to constantly shit on because if i try to pull that with my dad he'll punch me through the wall so we got a plan i'm gonna dress up like a martian i'm gonna go upstairs save my mom constantly <laughs> treat her like shit and then the movie will be over this sounds awesome so as soon as milo leaves gribble talks to his robot companion too cad uh -huh. He's like, brother, this is going to be awesome. What's going to happen is he's going to go up there, get chased around by some of these sis guards for a minute. Then I'm going to hit this button, save his life, shoot him back down here. And then he's going to learn to stay down here with me where it's safe. It's the perfect plan, Two Cat. We are going to be best friends forever, Two Cat. I mean, you and I are best friends forever, ever. But he and I are going to be best friends forever in a different way. Like, I'm not going to try to stick anything in him that's on me like I do with you two. Cat. He's gonna be the one thing in my life, Two Cat, that is not sticky as shit. Milo goes topside, and he's in this Tron-inspired world of gray and black and white, offset by stark, illuminating white lights with blue accents. The Martians all march around in formation, and but we haven't talked about the shape of the female Martians in this movie. They have these tiny, narrow waists. They have asses like Nicki Minaj. Mm -hmm. They have a gap between their thighs, the width of a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have comparatively small female human 
breast. It is not as overly sexualized as Laura Croft, but it's pretty close. You know, the, you gotta give something to the dads bringing their kids to this movie, I guess. Huh? You know, Gribble's got a dribble chat. Milo <laughs> ends up like falling into step with, and then there's a video of the supervisor. Dad! Affleck! <laughs> Milo goes, man, Mars needs Botox, am I right? She sucks. This whole place sucks. He sees some graffiti on the wall, this like flower graffiti that we saw earlier in the movie. That's just to let us know that that's going on. And then there's this big tower that we learn is called the Citadel in the middle of the room. Gribble tells him. Yeah. He's like, hey, brother, your mom's at the top of that big tower. Get up there and save her. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reprogram the ship, the spaceship that brought you here to Mars, and we'll do a little return back to Earth. Bing, bang, boom. You're back home in time for Pop-Tarts. Wait, Gribble. Gribble has the ability to get himself back to Earth, but he mm -hmm. doesn't go? That's right. All right. Yeah. Gribble's a terrible person. Even Tukad, his little robot friend, seems to be disappointed in Gribble, but he knows better than to voice too much uh, of a complaint because that means he just gets dribbled on again. Well, he knows what happened to one cat. <laughs> <laughs> one cat eventually the works were a little too gummed up for one cat to move in. <laughs> one cat just stays in the bedroom now it's still sentient but it can't move anymore the only thing that one cat says is a robotic kill me kill me milo goes through this security checkpoint he unintentionally sets off the alarm well it's unintentional by him gribble knows that he's going to set off the alarm the alarm goes off the guards grab him Gribble presses a button to open an escape hatch, but it opens up an escape hatch under a different female Martian who's plummeted down into the trash dump below. Good luck, Lady Martian. Mm -hmm. And then Milo gets abducted by some guards. They slap a tracking device on his back. So Gribble knows where Milo's being taken, and then they also know where Gribble is. So they take Milo to the top of the Citadel, this big tower, and then Milo just runs off with these female guards shooting at Milo, and Gribble is prattling on about, like, Rubik's Cubes and Michael Jackson's Thriller album. And Milo says, hey, Gribble, stop being such an idiot and tell me which way to get out of here. And Gribble turns on Milo and he's like, hey, 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 brother, what did you call me? Idiot? Did you call me an idiot? Look, bro, that is not cool, amigo. You want me to save you? You need to apologize. You need to say, best friend Gribble, who I love more than high C ecto coolers based on the popular movie Ghostbusters. I'm sorry I called you an idiot and I will stay with you on Mars for the rest of my life, even if my mom doesn't die, which she is most likely to do by the end of this movie. Shut up. You suck. I mean, I'm, uh, all right. I'm so, I guess I, if I had to apologize to anybody that I'm talking to right now, I guess it might be you. I'll take at it as an apology. Go left, little buddy. And Milo jumps in this safe space and a door closes behind him. And then he throws down his helmet that emits this screeching sound. And then the helmet comes to a rest. And we see in the viewfinder, the cis guards come in and capture Gribble. And Gribble just starts screaming out, Mommy! Mommy! It's real unsettling. <laughs> Milo then realizes like, man, stupid Gribble's not even on the radio anymore. I'm about to get captured. That guy sucks. Yeah, I take back that apology I didn't just make. You suck almost as much as my mom, and she sucks the most. In kind of a horrifying moment, you see the handle on the door. Yeah start to jiggle while Milo uh -huh. is trapped in this room. So his only way out is onto this ledge. He's like Robert Hayes in Cat's Eye. Dude, when that happened, that's the first thing I was thinking. Is like, <laughs> if a pigeon starts pecking his face, it's going to be the best thing that ever happened. But... <laughs> It, yeah, he ends up turning a corner before the guard can find him on this ledge. Then he gets splashed by some paint. Gribble, is that you? Oh, I told you not to dribble on me, you fat <laughs> son of a bitch. Oh, wait. And he ends up falling off the side of this building. And this is where we see Key, the alien we met earlier in the movie, putting flower graffiti on this tower. Yep. And she ends up swinging to save him, grabs him out of the air. When she talks, Bo, it is a garbled mess of grammatical correctness key was like we must cleaning paint off you before someone is seeing you and sometimes she talks in this strange alien yoda ease but then other times she just speaks naturally fluent
fluent English. The filmmakers did not try to keep this consistent whatsoever. It's half Yoda and half Joe Friday. Even outside of the Joe Friday stuff that she does that we'll get to in a minute, sometimes she's just like, yeah, guys, come on. We need to leave right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Key, can we have a uh, take two of that? Uh, why? I nailed it. <laughs> yeah. She ends up pulling this tracker off of him and says, this is being used to track not you, but whoever you were talking to. And Milo goes, oh, you mean that fat guy? Oh, he sucked. But he's might be my way off this planet. We might need to help him. I'm going to go this elevator. See you later, alien who saved my life. You suck too. <laughs> <laughs> So he jumps in this, the elevator, takes it down, and so Key ends up having to jump after him, like literally down this elevator shaft and gets in the elevator car with him. She's like, let me ask you something, Milo. How do you turn on? What do you tune in? And how do you drop out? What powers do flowers have? Oh my god, you sound stupid. Where'd you <laughs> learn all this stupid shit? Are you a girl? How did you learn anything? Girls can't learn anything. My stupid mom taught me that. Accidentally. Turns out, Chad, that she was watching some TV show that was like a classified Earth transmission. Yeah, it's called Freaks on Our Streets. Yeah. It's one of those shows that depicted hippies in the 70s, the way the Beverly Hillbillies would would interpret hippies kind of a Dobie gillis kind of vibe only it's way yeah. more colorful uh-huh she stole a bunch of episodes of this show and, and and she was like i never saw anything like it i was too watching this and watched a bunch of episodes of this dumb show and so she's basically a space hippie yeah and Milo is like, look, I don't have time for your 1960s era shenanigans. I got to save my mom because I need somebody to shit on on the regular and you're not going to cut it for me. Sorry, lady. He says, oh, I was seeing the memory where you said you would be better off without her. Yeah, I know I said that and I meant it. But also, she kind of takes care of me and I'm not of legal age yet. And also, it's really fun to see the hope in her eyes die when I tell her what a terrible mom she is. And then she looks at me sometimes and she knows what a shitty person I am. And she knows what a failure she is as a mother. And that feels pretty good. Did you see the memory where I made her cry? Yes, I was saying that. What was these emotions that she has? Yeah, that's called disappointment and sorrow. It's pretty cool. Regret? Shame? Besides, she loves me and that's real stupid. What is being this love? Well, you know, it's like when you constantly shit on somebody and they just keep coming back for more. I mean, if I punch you in the stomach over and over, you keep coming back. That's because you love me. So... <laughs> Milo ends up taking shoot number three that he learned from Ribble. We're heading down to the trash bros, man. Yeah, and so Key watches him jump down the trash and is like, I don't think I will be going to the trash today. <laughs> and so Milo ends up hunting for Gribble among all this garbage. And it turns out his platform is just crashed to the Stupid earth. Stupid Gribble, where are you? He checks his watch. He's like, oh no, I've only got five and a half hours to save my stupid mom <laughs> and so he finds a time capsule that gribble was keeping yeah that has gribble scratches all over it that says it's private keep out no martians allowed whatsoever well, why would he write that martians can't read english because he's a child like he, he's a grown man with a child's mind spelling errors <laughs> are embarrassing yeah it's like a r turned the wrong way and, <laughs> and inside is a single sneaker uh-huh and then a sweatshirt that's a picture of gribble as a kid and his mom this is where milo realizes like wait a second gribble's name is stupid george what a stupid name his last name's ribble george ribble i'm just gonna keep calling him gribble milo finds two cat who's turned over and trapped under this big gear uh -huh. he's like hey stupid robot where's that stupid fat guy that owns you two cat displays an <laughs> image of this wall that's like <laughs> the hiroshima <laughs> wall where you just see the vague outline of somebody after they've been reduced to atomic dust oh shit they're gonna kill him i wonder if that's gonna smell like pork i better go up there and check it out i bet that fat <laughs> son of a bitch is gonna smell like bacon when he fries back topside they strap gribble into these leg braces as they prepare to kill this moron who keeps offering to bribe these women with slinkies and skateboards and cabbage patch dolls and other toys 
shirts from the 80s. In fairness, he does offer up blue mascara and leg warmers. There is a moment where he legit just pleads for his life. It's horrifying. This is a children's movie. I know. Where, where somebody is being led up, like, not since Sean Penn's performance in Dead Man Walking. <laughs> <laughs> have i felt so moved by someone facing their own demise <laughs> this fat bastard's gonna get roasted yeah man i told her i was looking for a loophole from the bible <laughs> key shows back up our hippie alien who jumps back in line to watch this you know execution <laughs> well it only happens every so often yeah when do you get to see this fat earthling <laughs> reduced to a pile of cinders like you know <laughs> you're firing the alludium p32 space modulator at him <laughs> Before they can shoot, Milo swings in and kicks the cis agents into an unauthorized dog pile, which again tangles them all up because it's apparently a running gag. Well, it happens twice. Is that a running gag? It happens at the end also. Oh. When he kicks the original batch of cis guards, one of their guns flies in the air and lands in Key's hand. Right. And then Milo runs over to rescue Gribble. More cis soldiers come running in with guns. I still don't understand what happened to the first group of cis soldiers maybe he killed them i have no idea also they are surrounded by thousands of female martians just doing nothing they're just watching all of this happen mm -hmm. and then the supervisor sees that key has a gun in her hands and she screams ah, 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 ah. and then key raises the gun points it at gribble and instead she removes a small piece of the big gun which makes a little gun and then she throws that to milo and then two cat swoops down grabs key attacks attaches her to the balloon and they fly away and then milo takes this tiny gun he shoots a circle of blast around the feet of he and gribble while gribble just screams like a josh gad and then after perforating the floor milo jumps up in the air comes down smashes through the floor they fall down to who knows where who cares and then a bunch of cis guards run over blast the hole with lasers none of which kill gribble or milo because that would be something interesting to happen in our movie although it's heavily implied mostly by gribble that hey man I, I can't lie i just shit my pants when they were shooting at us there i have done soil myself it's not heavily implied he says hey man if you ever save somebody like this again you need to bring a backup pair of underwear because i've shit myself <laughs> Last part was on the editing room floor, but that's what happened. Yeah, so they end up... Guess where, Bo? In the man cave trash pile. All roads leave to the man cave trash pile. A bunch of these hairy, dopey male aliens are around. They sing a dance and hugging ensues. What are you doing? Why are you dancing like this, you bunch of stupids? I was thinking maybe you were cool, Gribble, because you had all those sex robots <laughs> that you keep up in your <laughs> platform. But now I think maybe you suck as much as everybody. And Gribble says, hey, man... Look, these guys, they hug. They're the male Martians. They're the ones that provide physical and emotional support to one another. They're constantly talking about their feelings without judgment. Or they, they don't feel a need to problem solve or provide solutions. You know, they just understand to a fault. They always know the supporting thing to say when someone needs to hear it at the right time. That's why the women topside throw these assholes down here because they're so amazingly awesome plus they don't mind when i shit myself i do it a lot i've got <laughs> uh what you call ibs and what that means is i be shitting also just to let you know i'm really into what i call martian taxidermy because periodically a corpse will come down here and i'll stitch it together and fill it with sawdust and just keep it around creative emergency purposes sometimes i wear it i pretend i'm uh, one of the martians and then sometimes I dribble on it. I'm sure that you do. Look, weirdo, we got to get out of here. Those cis are going to come find us. And then immediately, the cis show up wearing jetpacks with searchlights and they're blasting lasers. Wingnut, the only male Martian whose name we know, mm -hmm. he escorts Gribble and Milo down a sewer tube where Gribble and Milo fall into this river of what I'm guessing is raw sewage. <laughs> they go underwater and they pop up in this knockoff of the magical land of Pandora from James Cameron's Avatar. Straight down to the flying jellyfish and and the luminescent glowing colors on the surface
surface of the ground. It's nuts, man. Avatar came out two years before this, and it is offensively derivative. Yeah, so Milo realizes, like, oh no, I've only got three and a half hours to save my stupid mom. Grivel says, hey man, I got good news and better news. One, Two Cat is tracking us by our headsets. He is going to be here any minute. Better news, he is bringing one cat. Milo says, shut up and get your handcuffs over here. I'm going to blast him off with this tiny gun that I've got. Kapow! Gribble, he almost shits himself again. Milo says, we got to get up there and save my mom, all right? I appreciate her for all of the stupid things that she does for me that allows me to constantly treat her like a piece of garbage. My goal is to grow up and be just like my dad. He treats her like total shit. I treat her like partial shit. Someday, dad, I'm going to make you proud. Brother, I hear what you're saying, but after being shot at and the situation with my drawers, I am not ever going back to the top side again. I, this is where I live now. Which is weird because that was Gribble's plan earlier was to save Milo's life so that he would be indebted to him forever. And here he says, hey man, I appreciate you saving my life and everything, but fuck that. I'm not going top side with you no more. But this only <laughs> lasts for about 30 seconds because Milo is like, Oh, is that right, George? What did you call me? That's right. I saw your stupid sweatshirt with you as a fat little kid. Where did you get that? You had no right to go inside of my time capsule and find my sweatshirt with my beloved mother on it. Look, man, I know how you feel. You know how I feel. Nobody knows how I feel. I'm special. Look, man, look at this tiny video display and it'll explain everything. Look, they abducted my mom and when I was little, I was a good kid. I did my chores. I put my things away. I did as I was told. And that's why they chose my mom. Because of me. They abducted and killed my mother because I did what she told me. What kind of message does that send to little kids watching this movie? Turns out it was all my fault. All right, I'm back in. I'm back in, little guy. We're going to go up there and help you save your mom. One of the many lessons in this movie, be a good kid and your mother's going to get abducted and kill and it'll be your fault yeah so key shows up along with two cat who's a guy so goes upside now all right here she's back great key is like digging on all the art in the ruins and then gribble puts it together like hey wait a second are you that cool alien that's been doing all the graffiti on the walls been tagging everything man that is cool i am very suddenly and against all odds totally in love with you in this movie that flips on like a light switch he also explains to milo just to backtrack real quick when my mom came up here they strapped her on this operating table with a glass shield on top is your mom anything like that yeah it was like a snow globe but it sucked more like a long flat snow globe with your mom inside yeah that's right, All right here's what they did to my mom they put her in a bigger uh, snow globe and then when the sun came up it incinerated her and she died hey you don't think something like that could happen to my mom do you absolutely not but yes yeah so milo is knows that the clock is ticking on his mother's life shit we gotta get up there and save my mom think about how guilty she's gonna feel she'll do anything i'll say like i'll be like hey mom i want some baskin robbins go get me some mint chocolate chip and then she'll go get it and she'll bring it back and i'll say this is mint chocolate chip i said chocolate chip and she'll be like no you said mint chocolate i'm like no i wanted chocolate chip and then i'll make her go back to the store and then when she comes back i'll be gone i'll like run away for a couple of days and never call the cops i'll tell you what little brother why don't you uh just lead us on out of here i'm gonna hang back here with this alien for a second so uh listen i don't know uh what you're doing this weekend uh if you know this little guy gets his mom or even if he doesn't really doesn't matter to me hey uh how about you and me maybe i don't know do a little dribbling you ever heard of that? They got that in them TV shows of yours? Yes, on TV show I watch, they dribble all the time. Dribble basketball, and they sell drugs. Tell you what, uh, I think we can combine those two into a surprising way. Have you ever heard of jinkum? This is really a fermented feces and urine, and you breathe in the bouquet of intoxicants, and it takes you on a magic carpet ride, sweetheart. <laughs> and so she <laughs> seems cool with it, which takes him aback a little bit, and so he ends up stumbling into a bunch of vines that... That. Oh shit! I, I just ran into a plot point. <laughs> <laughs> Man, can you believe this? There's a whole script point here behind me on the wall. Yeah, look, it's a picture of a bunch of Martians, men and women and a little baby all hanging out together looking happy. Classic family. Man, woman, and child. The way the Lord God intended. <laughs> a nuclear Martian family. That's what we got here on this wall. And so Key says, oh, I will be taking a picture of this. And, and does with her little cell phone device. Key also helps Milo make a plan 
plan where she basically has this 3D map where she's like, this is being the Citadel. And this over here is where your mom is being kept. Then they see on the wall of this main area, there are now like wanted posters of Milo and Gribble up. Uh huh. Gribble is like, man, if they see us, they are going to throw us right in the alien pokey. That's where we need to be. We need to be in jail. That's where my stupid mom is. She's in the sick bay next to jail. That's where they put the criminals up to the people that are going to die because they're so sick. Whatever you say, man, I stopped listening. I was looking at this alien's ass, man. I'm going to follow that wherever it leads. So they make their way to the top of the Citadel in an attempt to try to get put into jail. And they go into this room where there's a couple of female aliens with also great big thick asses. And then he just reaches in and grabs like a couple of tranquilizer sticks or maybe they're death blades and just stabs them in the throats of these two alien women and I think she kills them. Uh, these aliens are now dead. Milo runs down to save his mom and then Gribble is following and he looks over one of the jail cells and he sees Wingnut who had been captured by the sis earlier. Gribble opens up the jail door and then Wingnut comes out and then apparently all the doors open up and all of these male alien idiots walk out just like <laughs> yeah and they fill up the hallway and Gribble is like hey man you guys us need to take off down below go in this chute go down here we know son of a bitch you guys are just the dumbest down in this hole and they're like oh they also look up at this big screen where they're separating the male and female hatchlings and they're sending all the males down to the trash which is why they were having this party to get excited to raise these kids i hope mm -hmm. and then that's where gribble is just like man y'all gotta get down there and save them kids they're gonna die which they don't do they just stare at him like the morons they are and so finally Gribble is just like look we are going to circle back around to this I hope them kids are alive when we get down there I survive they'll survive they'll figure it out he then leads our team of heroes in quotes to this silo where they have to get by a bunch of Martians to get to a ladder on the other side of the room the way they do that is Gribble hacks the system and opens up the silo so that all the air is flowing out and the Martians have to run into the hall while Milo, Gribble, and Key put on some helmets and run past them into this silo and then Gribble shuts the door behind them and kind of fuses it shut. Did you find it funny when Gribble, as they run past the aliens that were escaping, and Gribble says, good game, good game, good game. Yeah, that was all right. It made me laugh. I'll give credit where credit was due. That was funny. But I was so starved for anything. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, it's such a <laughs> desert of entertainment. And so Milo ends up running to the this ladder while Gribble and Key are going to get in the rocket. Milo is like, oh man, Mars sucks. I got to get up here and do this super jump all the way and save my mom. Stupid Mars. She's so far away. Oh my God. He checks his watch and sure enough, there are only moments left, which is good for me because I know this movie is almost over and I could be at. Back on the spaceship, Gribble really falls in love with Key for no good reason at all. And also we hear that Gribble has activated the spaceship to launch whenever someone says the name Gribble. He makes it voice activated, right. Milo rushes to save his mom. Time is running out. The sun is coming up and then Milo trips over the Mars rover and he falls down into a hole. Mm -hmm. So his mom's going to die, Bo. Yeah. He tries to do this super jump out of this ravine, but ends up kind of missing and is falling back in. And then Gribble is like, don't worry, brother. I'm here to save the day. I got this kick-ass jump pack I found on the rocket ship. And it was Gribble sized, which is real fortunate. I mean, it turns out that my ass and the Martian female ass, roughly the same size. Pretty cool. What I had to do was I had to turn it upside down and then rotate the jetpack and it fit like a charm. He ends up grabbing Milo, yanking him out of this ravine and flies him the rest of the way to the snow globe where his mom is. So glad you're here flying me over. It would have sucked if I had to do it on my own. No problem, man. By the way, I'm not giving you any credit, Gribble. I'm going to tell my mom I did this all by myself. I'm not going to share her guilt with anybody. When he drops Milo off, Gribble says, turns out, man, all these cis guards are coming out and alarms are going off. And for the first time since I've been on Mars, brother, I'm going to do the right thing. Hey, 
you think that sexy Martian heard that? You think she understood it? I don't know. Look, I gotta go save my mom, all right? If she dies, I'm in a shit storm. How am I gonna explain this to my awesome dad? Like, get out of here, Gribble. Yeah, I got you, man. Sorry. Hey, look, I'm just trying to get it wet, man. Squirrel's gotta get it. Go! All just right, all right, I'm going. Here. I don't care. Get out of here. So Milo rushes into this snow globe death chamber, and he's like, stupid bum, wake up. We gotta get you out of here. You're gonna die. And then the, the sun comes up, the laser starts firing and barreling down towards the mom, and the mom's like, ah, oh, just let me sleep a little longer, hon. Gribble gets back to home base. He stops the sis by electrocuting the door lock on the main building, which kind of backfires and electrocutes him. Key sees this, and she says, Gribble, which activates the launch code for the rocket ship. Mm -hmm. This laser's coming down. It's going to kill Milo's mom, but at the last minute, Milo pulls his mom away, and she is saved from certain death. And the electricity that comes in from this sunbeam blows up all the robot nanny bots back in the home base. Also, all these hairy-ass Martian men... Who did not go down shoot number three. No, they have left these children to fend for themselves so that they can go on the attack. Yep. And also, these hideous furry babies are jumping on the guards in the nursery, too. There's a real Martian battle royale that takes place. Everybody starts beating each other up. All these little hatchling kids grab electric cattle prods and start zapping the female Martian guards in their asses. Key calls out to Milo, you have only two minutes to get to the spaceship. So Milo screams out, come on, mom, you ungrateful, lazy jerk. It just saved your life. We got to get on that spaceship. We're going to stay on this crappy planet forever. And they don't even have Papa John's here. The mom realizes she's not on Earth anymore and she starts screaming. Key screams out, we only have 60 seconds. So Milo puts a helmet on his mother. He has a helmet on his head. The two of them step out of the Kill Mom 3000 laser box and they bounce across the landscape of Mars to make their escape towards the rocket that's going to take off. And then Milo's mom sees that the Martians inside this building are all just beating the shit out of <laughs> each other. And Milo's mom says, are those Martians? Yeah, the hairy ones are the good guys. The other ones, they suck. Yeah, basically the men are good all the women are evil as they're fleeing the supervisor sees milo and his mother running across the landscape she grabs a gun grabs a gun knocks out a window yeah steps out onto the surface of mars and takes aim at milo at milo's head yeah she's gonna shoot this child in the head Bo. oh if only chad you know powers booth saw this and he was like mm hmm take the kill shot i'll tell you what uh what i wouldn't do is warn him just take the shot she's about to shoot this kid in the fucking head and then gets this tackled is a children's movie <laughs> Dude, we have seen people beg for their lives in front of a firing squad. <laughs> oh, it's going to get worse. Oh, it yes, it is, Chad. <laughs> so she gets tackled by Gribble. The supervisor does. Yeah. And so the shot goes wide, but it hits the ground near Milo's feet, sending him flying because of the low gravity. And we get a slow motion shot of this child's helmet shattering into a million pieces. He's going to die, Bo. Yeah. So he's like a fish out of a bowl is just hur, hur. and his mother comes to milo takes her helmet off uh -huh. puts it on his head and breaks off the lever so he can't take it off i watched this with my wife and she acknowledged <laughs> how horrible it was but having a son when this scene happens she was in tears she was like this is horrible <laughs> yeah i'm so sad <laughs> So this mother just starts choking to death on the surface of this planet uh -huh. while Martians watch. And then Milo grabs her, holds her in his arm. And he's like, no, mom, no. Look, I love making fun of you. And I love making you feel like garbage. All right. You got to go home with me. And of course she can do nothing but smile benevolently as the life leaves her body. I think she knows that it was like a real checkmate moment. The <laughs> <laughs> the game that these two play, she's like, I win. So Gribble <laughs> is like, wait, what is going on over there? Is somebody's mom dying? Dude, not on Gribble's watch. Hang on, little buddy. He starts running for Milo and his mom. And on the way, he grabs the helmet that was originally intended for his mother that we saw in a flashback. Right. We forgot to mention that. that yeah, it doesn't matter. Earlier. Yeah, and he slips it over the head of Milo's mom. It seals and bingo, bingo. She's okay. She was in danger for about 
four seconds. And Milo is like, look, I hate to say this, but I think my life would not actually be better if you were gone. When I was watching you choke to death, there was part of me that thought a really small voice. But it was a voice inside me that said, maybe your mom shouldn't die horribly on an alien planet. Also, you owe your life to me. And don't say that Gribble was the one who saved you. He's my best friend. And so, by proxy, I saved your life, all right? You owe me forever. Check, check, check me. So, this basically makes you my slave? So, when we get back, it's going to be grilled cheeses every day at 1 p.m. on the dot. I'm going to take one bite and I'm going to throw it out the window and make you make another one. If it is even slow. Lightly burned on one side. I'm gonna make you eat it, but I'm gonna step on it first. Key, who is in the rocket, we forgot to mention it took off during all the drama earlier, but then she immediately comes back and she's like, I has the rocket under control now. And you're like, okay, great. So Milo and his mom and Gribble, they run towards the spaceship, and the supervisor, who apparently just buried herself under a layer of Martian topsoil, she pops up out of the <laughs> ground with her gun in her hand uh-huh. and aims at these, these three earthlings. Her head it totally looks like balls with a mouth, by the way. And then Key comes over, kicks the gun out of the supervisor's hand. A random blast goes off, scaring all the hatchlings in the main building, so much so that they jump into the arms of the male Martians, because of course. Mm-hmm. And then Key shows the supervisor a photo that she took of the mural down in Fandora. And she says, you're a liar. We are meant to be raised by families and not machines, by parents. Who is this lesson for? Is it for the supervisor? Are you trying to teach the audience something? I don't understand where this lands. It's a good question. I think the idea is that it's supposed to make kids realize like, man, my mom, it doesn't suck as much as I thought she did. I mean, she still sucks, but maybe not as much. The supervisor says, and we do get to hear her speaking English to the translator now. And she says, you are fools. We don't have time to raise the hatchlings. The males are always partying, having fun, being kind. They are worthless. That is why they throw them into the trash. And then the cis show up, like five of them. They're going to kill Key, but then they realize that the supervisor is an asshole and that they were meant to be raised by families or something. Right. And then they drag the supervisor off to, I guess, be executed immediately. <laughs> well, we'll see what her fate turns out to be. Kind of a hell on earth for her. It's a real, like, Rod Serling <laughs> picture, if you will. Milo and his mom, they get back on the spaceship and they return to Earth. Gribble is with them and he decides he's going to stay with Key and have crazy human Martian sex. Maybe Gribble saw Cocoon back in the 80s and wanted to have some of that Steve Gutenberg swimming pool alien sex that he saw as a child. Yeah, I wonder if he's asked any questions of like let me before we go back to mars and i abandon my home planet forever let me just ask you you do have holes right from the neck down (laughs) how many holes do you have and also can i get in if i fit in how many have teeth (laughs) right it's like (laughs) the reverse of a male cat it's just i'd be having spines in all of these holes whoa 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 i'll tell you what uh this may not work out after all also my (laughs) saliva is acid oh hey sister i I might just have to stay here on earth because at least i will not be getting boils on anything well you know maybe a little hurt but that ain't nothing i'll take a little valtrex for that so it's the next morning the spaceship lands on earth apparently this whole thing took place in one night Bo. much Mm. like scrooge's transformation and milo and his mom they uh head back to their house after gribble and key and two jacks or whatever the spider cat fly back off into space so milo and his mom they go into their home and then milo hugs her son and she says you know i love you and then milo says i know mom and you're like what a dick (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) not not a i love you too just like yeah i get it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like you tell somebody you love them you want an echo uh-huh. like, 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 god how many times we gotta talk about this stop you're embarrassing me mostly because no one's around if someone else was here i'd be calling you out for being such a weirdo so it's eight fifteen or something of course dad comes home which he does most mornings about this time reeking of gin and <laughs> other women's crotches and he rolls in and milo is so happy to see his father milo says hey uh i'm gonna take the trash out he takes the trash out Bo. but instead of putting in the trash can milo sets the plastic bag 
on the porch and shoots it with the laser blaster that he stole from Mars, Mm -hmm. leaving a massive burn mark on their front porch. (laughs) Yeah, that's thousands of dollars of damage. He's a piece of shit. And then the movie starts playing Crazy Little Thing Called Love by Queen, and we get these images of Mars where the aliens have evolved and now they're covered in color. Robots are being incinerated. And then here we see the final fate of the supervisor that you hinted to earlier. Yeah, she is now consigned to work in the nursery Uh where she, along with some of the hairy dudes, are changing diapers on these god-awful looking creatures. Uh She holds one up and its diaper slips down and it just pisses in her face. (laughs) And then the Martians hack the rover and they send back pictures of hippie graffiti flowers to Earth. And then the movie thankfully ends. Yeah. And like you said uh, in the upfront, like the credits is uh, really just a lot of, hey, we're doing motion capture for this hideous form of CGI. Did nobody stick around to watch this? Oh, no. I mean, as soon as I heard Queen start playing, I was like, I am done. We are out. But it turns out there was a couple of scenes that mattered to the plot kind of like the supervisor getting a face full of piss yeah but also it's like okay well there's like all of a sudden there's life on mars and everyone in the universe knows it that's fun i guess yeah that's it that's uh mars needs moms it's terrible you know what else mars needs Bo? it needs our next episode man we are not leaving mars for the next episode it's very exciting Bo, tell us what's coming up on the next episode of big six movies when we're talking about bombs there are very few bigger bombs than the movie John Carter. A summer blockbuster that never happened. A Disney-produced film. It is the coming out party to some degree for Taylor Kitsch, who was famous for Friday Night Lights, I am led to believe. It is an adaptation of the Edgar Rice Burroughs novel, Princess of Mars, and it is a dud on every level. It features bad CGI like we saw in this one. It features unlikable characters like like we saw in this one the main character is a real asshole as well is jim carrey in it no i mean maybe he could have been one of the aliens <laughs> but it's got an incredibly convoluted plot that doesn't make any more sense the more you think about it. is it long oh yeah it's long all right well it's about it's a solid two hours all right well we've watched longer and have we seen worse yes we have seen worse movies but i don't know that we've seen one that's gonna make you feel more apathetic about the subject matter than this one i think apathy gets a bad rap all right come back and see us in two weeks time as always like rate review you can send us an email at pick six movies at gmail.com we're kind of sort of on social media floating around we got lives we got things to do we don't have time to always be chit chatting with a bunch of people online but for you loyal listeners we'll chit chat with you well any final thoughts that you have on mars needs moms pick six movies sucks i hear you brother Ooh.